Island Crimes and Mysteries with Newells. Hey guys, welcome to Ireland Crimes and Mysteries, the podcast channel that takes you on a journey through the dark and mysterious side of Ireland's history. From infamous crimes to unsolved mysteries, we explore the stories that have captivated and intrigued people to this very day. Join us as we uncover the stories behind these cases. Whether you're a true crime enthusiast or a lover of all things mysterious, this is the podcast for you. So sit back, relax, grab a cup of coffee, and let's explore the dark side of Ireland together. This podcast has been compiled from information gathered in the public sphere, like news articles and documentaries. Everything in this podcast is alleged unless a conviction has taken place. Hey guys and welcome. Today we're going to talk about the disappearance of Annie McCarrick, who went missing on the 26th of March 1993 either somewhere in Dublin itself or somewhere in the Wicklow Mountains. Now, her disappearance became one of the defining moments in Ireland in the 1990s. And he was one of the first of a number of women to go missing back in that decade, never to be seen again. These included Jojo Dullard, who I have covered in a previous podcast. And to this day, many of these cases remain unsolved. But of course, as we delve into her story, we are reminded that there are real people behind these missing persons cases with all their hopes, their dreams and of course, the loved ones that have been left behind with aching hearts, yearning for their safe return. And this compelling story has captivated the hearts of people around the world. So join me now as we navigate through the complexities of this emotional journey honouring Annie's memory as we look into the facts, the theories and the emotions surrounding this perplexing case. Now, Annie McCarrick was born on March 21st, 1967 to her parents, John and Nancy McCarrick, in the Bayport area of Long Island, New York. Annie was an only child and she was idolised by her parents and the wider family as well. Annie's parents were of Irish heritage, And they were very proud of this fact and they passed this on to their daughter, the love of all things Ireland. Bayport in Long Island was known to have a large Irish community and the McCarricks, they immersed themselves in the Irish scene, going to any flas that were on and befriending like-minded people. So you can only imagine when Annie made her first trip to Ireland in 1987 as part of a school tour with the Skidmore College in New York, that her excitement was palpable. She immediately felt a connection with Ireland, falling in love with its culture and its people. She now understood the deep connection her parents felt to Ireland. Annie loved the country so much that she told her parents on her return to New York that she wanted to go to college in Ireland. They were hesitant at first, obviously, their only child going across the, across the sea over to another country. But not wanting to stop her from pursuing her dreams, they did agree. So, in 1998, she headed to Ireland to begin her teacher training, where she first started in St. Patrick's in Drumcondra, and then she moved on to St. Patrick's in Maynooth, where she studied English literature. Now, while she was studying in Drumcondra, she did meet a Dublin man who she had a brief romance with. But that ended after a few months, and they, but they remained, they remained good friends. And she was also great friends with his family, and especially close to his brother and his fiancée. She was a very independent young lady and she would take on odd jobs to finance her college education. She worked for a time as a teacher's assistant in a school in, Bally, in the Ballymun area of Dublin. And, and this job, it, it reinforced a desire to pursue a teaching career for her. She also made lots of friends while she was in college and she was described as a bright, independent, friendly girl. One friend describing her as a ray of sunshine. In hindsight, Annie was probably a little, a little too naive in thinking that Ireland was ultimately the safe place. She loved everything about the country and, and probably to an extent had left her guard down thinking everybody was really friendly, making her very trusting of people. It never entered her head that anyone would try and harm her. She never felt out of place and actually felt really at home in Dublin, regularly seen out with her friends at sessions, trad sessions in the city. While in Manute College, Annie started going out with a new lad who was a fellow student. They were joint at the hip and were never seen without each other. 
So it did come as a big surprise after her graduation in 1990 with a BA in sociology and English literature that she announced she wanted to go home to New York to continue her studies at Stony Brook University. They did agree to stay in touch and he even went out to New York to visit her and stayed with her family. But as the time wore on, the distance became a problem and Annie was busy with her university work. So the relationship did fizzle out. By the end of 1992, Annie's longing to return to Ireland started to gnaw away at her and she made the decision to return to Dublin. She wanted to do her higher diploma course there. And this, of course, would give her the opportunity to teach in Ireland as well. So in January 1993, Annie, by now 26 years of age, returned to Ireland. Before she left for Ireland, Annie asked her mother would she come and visit her. And of course she said she would. So she made arrangements to come to Dublin in April of 1993. This gave Annie the chance to get settled in prior to her arrival. The morning of her departure, Annie's parents drove her to the airport and they waved her off. Little did they know that this would be the last time they would ever see their daughter again. Annie immediately settled back into life in Ireland and renewed her friendships with all her old friends that she had previously made. She initially stayed for a few nights with her ex-boyfriend's brother and fiancé before she got an apartment in St. Catherine's Court in Sandymount on the south side of Dublin. She shared this apartment with two other girls and they became fast friends. She got a job at the Courtyard Restaurant in Donnybrook and she really loved this job but she wasn't getting the hours that she would have liked so she started looking around for another job. Annie was fiercely independent and she was determined to finance herself through college. Even despite her parents being financially secure enough to help her out, she wanted to do it herself. She eventually found a new job at Cafe Java on Leeson Street and she was described there by her colleagues as being very reliable and hardworking. She was very popular with all the staff and, and the customers alike. She even made some of the desserts that were sold at the cafe. Annie had really enjoyed the few weeks in the run-up to her disappearance, between the St. Patrick's Day celebrations and nights out with friends. And of course, she was looking forward to her mum's visit, which was now scheduled for the 2nd of April. She was in great form. She'd been busy putting together an itinerary for her mother's visit. She was organising trips and to visit various locations that she knew her mother would love to see. So all this taken into account, it was obvious that Annie had no intention of voluntarily going missing. So moving on to the day of her disappearance, she had worked at the Cafe Java until 3pm. This was Thursday, the 25th of March, 1993. The manager of the cafe had asked her to hold on for about 10 minutes while she got her wages ready. But Annie was, after noticing how busy it was in the cafe, and she told her manager not to worry, that she would collect her wages the following day, which was the Friday. She even offered to make some of the desserts to bring in with her. This was the caring nature of Annie McCarrick. She was not due back into work officially until Saturday the 27th of March. On the Thursday evening, she went to visit some friends whom she chatted with for a few hours. And she was telling them all how excited she was about her mother's visit and how she would arrange for them to meet her mother when she arrived. At around 10pm, Annie got a lift back to her apartment in Sandymount by one of her friends and their son. When she arrived home, she was chatting with her flatmates for a while and then they all retired to bed. Her flatmates were up early the following morning, which was Friday the 26th, as they had work and they were all heading home for the weekend to their respective houses. They all chatted away over breakfast and as they left the apartment, they said Annie was sitting on the bed knitting. She told one of the girls that she was going to go for a little trip out to Enniscary with a friend that afternoon and that she had invited other friends over for dinner that Saturday night. And to add to this, she was making some preparations for her mother's visit. So all in all, Annie had a busy weekend planned for herself. The fact that Annie had the apartment to herself for the whole weekend would be the first major problem as there was no one there to notice when she didn't return home that Friday evening. So what were Annie's final movements on that Friday? Well, according to the evidence that has been gathered, after her flatmates had left, Annie went on to do some laundry. And then she decided to go to the local Quinsworth to do some shopping. She was preparing for the meal that she was going to be having with friends on the Saturday evening. 
She also bought the ingredients she needed for the desserts that she was making for Cafe Java. Annie's groceries would later be found in the grocery bag in her apartment. And these included cream, butter and meat. These were all food items that needed to be refrigerated. This lends itself to the theory that maybe she left in a hurry. When she left the Quinsworth supermarket, she then travelled up to the AIB bank in Clondalkin as she wanted to change her account from that branch to the branch in Sandy Mount. This visit to the bank was captured on CCTV and the haunting images show Annie queuing at the bank where she momentarily glances up towards the camera before looking away again. Knowing what was to follow, this makes this footage now take on a, a very eerie feeling. It was the last time Annie McCarrick would ever be officially seen again. There was nothing unusual of note at all in any of that footage. Annie looked totally relaxed. There was nothing that stood out or gave any hint of what was about to transpire. As she was making her way back to her apartment, Annie stopped at a phone box which was located at the Green in Sandyford. She wanted to ring her friend to confirm the dinner plans for Saturday night. And while she was there, then she rang another friend and asked her if she wanted to go for a walk out to Enniskerry. Now, unfortunately for Annie, this friend had injured her ankle and was unable to go for the walk. So Annie told her she was going to head out to Enniskerry herself. This unassuming decision by Annie, a sliding doors moment, if you will, set in motion a chain of events that would ultimately prove disastrous for her and heartbreaking for her family. When she was finished chatting to her friend, she made her way back to her apartment. She was later observed leaving the apartment by a man who was actually doing a job in the building. She said hi to him as she exited the front door and started walking in the direction of the bus stop near New Grove Avenue. This is where she would get the number 18 bus to Renla. She was actually seen shouting at the bus to stop as it was pulling away when she arrived. She'd been witnessed running after the bus by a local takeaway owner in Sandy Mount. He would later tell the Gardaí what he had seen, stating he saw her board the bus and then it drove away. From Renla, Annie would have gotten the 44 bus, which would have taken her straight out to the village of Enniskerry. She was actually seen by another friend who was in the queue for the bus, joining the back of the queue. The friend said the bus was particularly full that day, so she couldn't get Annie's attention as she was at the back of the bus and she saw Annie making her way up to the top deck. She stated Annie was wearing dark red cowboy boots and a tweed jacket, a pair of jeans and a tan coloured bag that she wore around her shoulder. When you think about all these events, so many what ifs arise. What if she'd been a few more minutes late and missed the bus entirely? What if her friend had been able to accompany her on the walk? What if the bus driver hadn't stopped to let her on? None of the events that were about to transpire would have happened if Annie had missed the bus as she would have had to wait another hour for the next one and it would have been starting to get dark when she arrived in Enniskerry. So the likelihood is that she would have made the decision not to make the journey in the first place. As I said, sliding doors. And now, as I previously stated, Annie was due to work at Cafe Java on the morning of the 27th of March, which was a Saturday morning. The staff started to get concerned when there had been no sign of her turning up and she hadn't rang to say she wouldn't be at work. It wasn't like Annie, who was always very punctual. And also she had planned to bring in the desserts for the cafe that day. They also noted that she had not come in on Friday for her wages as she had said she would to the manager on the Thursday before she finished work. Then on the Saturday evening, her friends arrived at her apartment at around 8pm as they had arranged for the dinner date with Annie. They were met with silence when they knocked on the door and this perplexed them as it was totally out of character for her to make arrangements and then not follow through on them. They hung around for a little while before they headed off to a nearby pub where they had a drink before heading back to her apartment. They couldn't understand it when again they knocked on the door and it went unanswered. They decided to head home and ring Annie from their house. But when they actually went to ring her, they realised they hadn't her number. So they rang her mother in New York and she gave them the number. They briefly mentioned to her mother that Annie had broken the dinner date, but at the time they didn't think much of it. They continued to ring the apartment through Saturday night and on into Sunday. But after several calls went unanswered, they decided to ring the cafe where they were told that Annie hadn't turned up for work on the Saturday. 
At this stage, they were becoming increasingly concerned for her, but didn't know what to do. That Saturday evening, her flatmates returned, and they were really surprised to see that Annie wasn't there to greet them. They were also concerned when they noticed the shopping bag from Quinsworth sitting there with all the food in it, and it was now starting to go off. It was obvious it had been there for a few days. It looked like Annie had returned from the supermarket and literally dropped the bag inside the door. On the Monday, her friends that had been due to go to dinner with her on the Saturday evening contacted her flatmates to see if Annie had returned, to be told she hadn't. They then rang the Café Java to see if she had turned up for work that morning, but she hadn't turned up there either, so by now panic really began to set in. They once again rang her mother Nancy in New York and asked her if she had heard from Annie. And on hearing that nobody had seen or heard from her daughter since the previous Friday, a really uneasy feeling began to creep in and Nancy immediately changed her flights and flew out to Ireland that evening. Her friends met Nancy at the airport and told her that they had still had no contact from Annie. So the decision was made to go immediately to the nearest Garda station, which was the Irish Town Garda station, and report Annie missing. This was the beginning of the nightmare, which to this day has not ended for the McCarrick family. It was now nearly four days since anybody had seen any, so the Gardaí took the missing persons report very seriously and an investigation immediately commenced under Detective Inspector Martin Donnelly. By the time Annie had been missing a week and no real leads were apparent, the decision was made to make a formal appeal for assistance to the public. A photograph of Annie was released and an appeal for information into her whereabouts was made to the media. A man by the name of Sam Doran got in contact with the Gardaí in the Irish Town Garda station. He spoke with detectives Tom Rock and Val Smith. He explained that he was a doorman at a pub named Johnny Fox's on the Ballybrick Road in the village of Glencullen in the Dublin Mountains. It's a popular destination for people from the city and it's about three miles from the village of Enniscary. It is known to be the highest pub in Ireland and is very popular with locals and tourists alike. Annie had excitedly told her friends that she was going to bring her mother there to visit the pub. Sam told the Gardaí that he was actually working there as a doorman on the night of the 26th of March 1993. He was on the door of the function room, which was attached to the pub, and a folk group named the Jolly Ploughmen were performing that night, with doors opening at 8pm. The Jolly Ploughmen were a well-known and popular act, so it was assumed that it was going to be a busy night. It was the job of Sam and his colleague Paul to oversee the collection of the £2 admission fee, so they were stationed by the admission desk at the door to the function room. He told the detectives that he remembered at some stage in the evening after 8pm a woman walking around and into the function room. She was looking around like she was trying to find a seat. She then walked past the payment desk where Sam was on duty. He said it was like she hadn't realised there was an admission fee, so he stopped her and asked for payment. He said she seemed surprised and immediately apologised and went to put her hand into her pocket when from behind her in the queue a voice said, I'll get it. Sam said she looked around and smiled at the man that had offered to pay but she didn't decline the offer and then she walked in alone into the function room. The man then proceeded to pay the £4 admission fee for the two of them. Sam said he was under the impression from her reaction to the payment that she hadn't arrived with this male stranger and didn't even know who he was but he did tell the detectives that he was certain that the girl he had seen was Annie. He said that even though the night was really busy with a lot of people and tourists about, he vividly remembered the American girl he had spoken to at the doors to the function room at Johnny Fox's pub. Whereas his co-worker Paul could not only vaguely remember the episode as he had been dealing with another customer at the time, so he could not categorically say that the girl was Annie McCarrick. They both stated that after this encounter they didn't remember seeing them again for the rest of the night. Detectives did take Sam's story seriously but also had to take into account the fact that in the course of Sam's work he was meeting hundreds of people on a daily basis, including lots of American tourists and there was the possibility that he could have mistaken Annie for someone who looked similar. By a massive coincidence, there was another American girl at the trad session in Johnny Fox's that night who bore a striking resemblance to Annie, down to her fashion sense. Due to a high volume of sightings of Annie being rang into the Gardaí and each having to be individually looked into, the vast majority would all turn out to be this American girl. 
So the Gardaí had to ask her if she wouldn't mind changing her style slightly as it was complicating the investigation. But the one thing that was different about Sam's story, according to the Gardaí, was that nobody had come forward to say they they were the people he had been talking about and have themselves ruled out. Sam had described the man who paid for this girl as being approximately 5 foot 8 inches tall and around the age of 25 to 28. He said he was clean shaven and had dark brown hair and was wearing a green wax jacket. A photo fit of this male was released to the media, but no one ever came forward saying they knew this person, nor did the person themselves come forward. As I previously stated, somebody did come forward that had seen Annie embark on the 44 bus. This girl was named Emer, and she had worked with her at the Courtyard restaurant and she told Gardy that just before 3pm on Friday the 26th of March she had been waiting at the bus stop for the number 44 bus just opposite the Ulster Bank in Renla. Just as the bus was pulling in she noticed Annie coming around the corner from the direction of the number 18 bus terminal. What made this piece of information interesting to the Gardaí was that this bus would have been the same bus that she had been seen catching in Sandyford approximately 25 minutes earlier. So it would have made sense. She had disembarked from the Sandymount bus and was making her way to the 44 bus. She said she saw Annie join the queue but she was at the beginning of the queue and Annie was at the back. And when Emer got on the bus she went towards the back of it and sat down. She said she tried to get Annie's attention but the bus was really full and Annie proceeded up to the second level. Emer then got off a few minutes later and the bus continued on with Annie still on board. But to this day she is still adamant that it was Annie McCarrick she saw boarding the bus. Unfortunately the bus driver couldn't confirm that she, it was Annie that had actually got on the bus nor was there CCTV on it to confirm that Annie had actually boarded the bus. Because of the potential sightings by Emer on the bus route to Enniskerry and then the alleged sightings by Sam the doorman at Johnny Fox's, Gardaí started to focus their investigation on following up on the leads in Enniskerry. Prior to this, the investigation had been more concentrated in the Sandyford area. As the investigation wore on and little progress seemed to be made, Annie's mother, who was by now joined by Annie's father John, her uncle Tim and her uncle-in-law, were starting to get frustrated. They decided to start doing their own investigations around Enniskerry. They went door to door and searched all the possible routes between Johnny Fox's and the village that she may have taken. On their visit to the post office in the village of Enniskerry, they spoke to a lady who worked there. And she recalled a young lady with an American accent having called into the post office and buying some stamps. The Gardaí had already done door-to-door inquiries in this area with no results, so this new information did not help to improve the confidence that Annie's family had in the Gardaí or their investigation. Now back in the 1990s, not every shop or street had CCTV like would be commonplace today, so there was no cameras there to back up this lady's statement that Annie had actually gone into the post office or even been in Enniskerry that day. So this potential sighting came to nothing, but it did reinforce the idea that she may have been there that day. Then Annie's father, John, offered a substantial award for any information that would lead to Annie's whereabouts. And in the meantime, the Gardaí compiled from the information they had already gathered a potential timeline from both the verified and unverified sightings of Annie on that day she disappeared. All roads appeared to lead to the village of Enniskerry. The only problem being her whereabouts could not be verified from 4pm to 8pm. In this intervening time, the sightings in the post office and Johnny Fox's pub allegedly took place. But as I said, neither could be verified as being 100% any. A private investigator who had been hired by her parents was under the illusion from his investigation that she was alive and living in Wicklow and that she had her own reasons for not coming forward. This seemed highly unlikely and given the fact he had no concrete evidence to back it up, it can only be taken with a pinch of salt. I mean, there was no reason for her to simply disappear and put her family and friends through all this emotional turmoil. Annie was looking forward to her future and especially to the visit of her mother and and she had lots of plans in place. The possibilities of what happened to her are endless. Did she meet this strange man at Johnny Fox's pub and did he do something to her? Did she get a lift from Enniskerry to Johnny Fox's and some misfortune befell her on the way? Did she just decide to disappear and start a new life? 
as I said, that seems highly unlikely. All possible outcomes from when she arrived in the village are speculative. What we know for sure is that she definitely left her apartment in a hurry. We know this from the food that was dropped just inside the door and left there to rot over the weekend. She did not turn up for her dinner date at her apartment with her friends, something totally out of character for Annie. She was a no-show at work and didn't even turn up to collect her wages, again totally out of character for Annie. But why did she leave her apartment in such a hurry? Was it because she realised the time and knew if she didn't leave there, there and then, she would miss the bus and any later bus would have made it too late to journey to Enniskerry? Had she arranged to meet somebody out there? If she had, maybe this man at Johnny Fox's pub was the person she had arranged to meet. But if it was an innocent meet-up, why has he never come forward? Or was she just going for a walk and met with some sort of accident? But why has she never been found, if that's the case? Over the years, there had been a large number of potential persons of interest in the investigation. One such person was a man who, it emerged, had a brief fling with Annie on the Saturday before she disappeared. Annie had told some of her friends about it, and they had come forward to the Gardaí and named the suspect, who vehemently denied the fling and any involvement in her disappearance, and even gave an alibi for the night Annie went missing. But after investigating his story and his alibi, the guardie felt it didn't ring true and he later admitted that Annie had in fact been telling the truth and they did have a brief fling. He said he had lied because he did not want his girlfriend to find out about it. There are many more leads like this that led nowhere in the end. But the one that has perplexed the guardie the most and frustrated the family the most is the man that allegedly, according to Sam, paid for who he thought to be Annie to get into the trad session that night. Despite numerous pleas to the public, this person has never come forward. Years later, there was rumblings that this man was in fact a hitman associated with the Irish Republican Army and had built up quite the reputation as a cold-blooded assassin. He was allegedly staying with some friends in a safe house in the Ratfarnham area where he was laying low trying to avoid being arrested by the special branch. He supposedly went out to Johnny Fox's pub under the illusion it was off the beaten track and he wouldn't be noticed. In a book called Missing, Presumed, written by retired Detective Sergeant Alan Bailey, who worked on the cold case inquiry into Annie McCarrick's disappearance, he talks about the possibility that she was murdered by a member of the Irish Republican Army, who she met that night in Johnny Fox's pub in Glencullen. A source allegedly told the Gardaí that he had panicked after telling Annie too many things about his life in an attempt to impress her and then realising he had said too much decided to murder her, the only way to truly ensure her silence. He then got help disposing of her remains from his associates. Seemingly he was completely taken by the tall, attractive young American and that he had spent an enjoyable evening with her in the pub. After realising how interested Annie was in anything to do with Ireland and him being under the influence of alcohol, he got carried away with his stories and divulged too much information to her about his dealings with the Northern Ireland conflict. Who knows after a few points how much he could have said, naming names, etc. and not realised until it was too late. Alan Bailey's source does go on to say that once the man began to sober up, the enormity of what he had said began to dawn on him and he began to panic there was only one course of action that he could take to ensure her silence. According to the source, Annie had already told him the general area of where she lived and he had convinced her to take a lift with him, saying he would drop her off at a taxi rank in the rat mines area. From there, she would be able to get a taxi home, he assured her. He then went to the bathroom and had arranged to meet up with her in the car park at the rear of the pub. This, of course, ensured that they would not be seen leaving the pub together. He'd already earlier that night parked his car, a Ford Sierra, in the car park in the area of the car park that would not be seen from the pub or from any of the security cameras at the back of the pub. He had parked his car there because of course he was being ultra careful as he was trying to avoid arrest himself. He met her in the car park and they both took off in his car together, Annie unsuspectingly thinking she was getting a lift back to the taxi rank. After they left the car park, according to Alan Bailey's source, he turned right in the direction of the mountains instead of going left, which would have brought them back towards the city. It would have been then that she realised that she was in a dangerous situation. 
According to the source, she tried to open the door and jump out. It was at this point he hit her in the face. After travelling about a mile above Johnny Fox's pub, he pulled into a lay-by and it is thought that it is here he ended her life. He proceeded to conceal the body in a ditch before driving home to the safe house in Ratfarnham. He told his minders what had happened, stating to them that she had approached him and appeared to know who he was. He said he thought she was special branch and fearing that he and his colleagues had been compromised, he tricked her into leaving the pub with him and proceeded to kill her. The source goes on to say that the following morning at first light, two cars drove to the area where he had left her body. One of the cars kept lookout while the other car would transport her body. This man has now been exiled to America by the organisation he worked for after an assault allegation had been made against him by the teenage daughter of another prominent member of the organisation. He was ordered never to return to Ireland after this. This story in Alan Bailey's book from an alleged, really reliable source only came to light in recent years and has been investigated by the Gardaí as a highly plausible explanation into her disappearance. Alan Bailey, who wrote the book, believes that this could be the key to solving the case and getting Annie's body returned to her family. Then, in March 2023, the Gardaí upgraded Annie McCarrick's case from that of a missing person to a murder inquiry after they received a new lead. It had emerged that a man living in the Sandyford area of Dublin had been identified as a suspect. Gardaí are now working on building a case against him, but still remain open-minded about the investigation. While over the decades Enniscary and Johnny Fox's pub were the main focus of the investigation, the focus has now turned to the Sandyford area, where it is speculated new digs and searches will take place in the future. During a press conference held in March 2023, Detective Inspector Eddie Carroll stated that investigators were keen to find Annie's handbag that she was seen carrying in the CCT footage of her in the bank prior to her disappearance. To date, this bag has never been found and the Gardaí believe that her murderer may have decided to keep it as a sick memento. Detective Superintendent Carl urged anybody that knows anything about the whereabouts of this bag to come forward. He said, quote, I'm appealing to those persons 30 years later to please come forward and speak to the investigating team. We want to speak to any person who has any information on the large brown handbag, which is believed that Annie was in possession of when she went missing. I want to speak to any person who met, spoke with or had any interaction with Annie McCarrick on the 26th of March 1993 or subsequently. There are person or persons who have information on the disappearance of Annie McCarrick and her murder on or about the 26th of March 1993 who haven't yet spoken to the Gardaí or who may have already spoken to the Gardaí but were not in a position to tell them everything that they knew at the time. He vowed to resolve the case for Annie's mother Nancy, saying she deserves to know what happened to her daughter on March 26, 1993. She's been waiting 30 years for answers. I and the investigating team are determined to gather all the information to find answers and bring the matter to a conclusion. I have made this commitment to Nancy and her family. He stated he is satisfied that it is more than likely now that Annie came to a foul demise and said that the decision to upgrade the inquiry was based on the entirety of the information available to the investigating team at Irish Town Garda Station. He fell short of disclosing specifics on any new evidence, but did confirm that it involved updated forensic techniques that were not available 30 years ago. To date, Gardaí have collected more than 5,000 documents, reports and exhibits and they have recorded over 300 statements into evidence. They travelled to America to inform Annie's 79-year-old mother Nancy of the upgrade to murder. Annie would have turned 56 only a few days prior to this. According to retired detective Alan Bailey, who had also worked as a liaison officer to the family, Nancy believes her daughter was killed for a long time. He stated that at the time of her disappearance, they had recommended it would be upgraded immediately to murder, stating that they had been satisfied there was no reason for her to leave home of her free will and believed that the evidence warranted a murder inquiry. However, it has taken 30 years for the murder status to be officially designated to the high-profile public investigation. He said he had spoken with Nancy and that she was happy that it has now been treated as a murder investigation, 
stating it was a positive move and that all they want at this juncture is Annie's remains to be recovered so that they'll have somewhere to go and remember her. Annie's father John died in 2007, heartbroken without ever knowing what happened to his daughter. But her mother and the extended family have never given up hope and to this day push for people with any information to come forward. Every phone call that Nancy receives, she hopes, is the phone call she has waited for, saying she has been found. Her disappearance devastated the family, leading to John and Nancy divorcing in 1998, each dealing with the enormity of what happened in their own way. But it was all too much for the couple to bear. In 2010, lawyers acting on behalf of Nancy went to court to seek an order of debt in absentia, which is the legal presumption of debt. On hearing the evidence which was read into record, the court issued the death certificate to her mother Nancy. She said that all she wants is Annie's remains returned to her and to be able to afford her the dignity of a proper burial, stating that this was far more important to her now than knowing who killed her daughter. She stated in an interview in March 2023 that she couldn't imagine that she would still be alive, saying that she did for a very long time, but now, unless something had happened to her, where she had no idea where she was, that just didn't seem possible at this point. She went on to say if anybody knew the slightest thing, it would be so kind of them to share it with the Gardaí. I have no desire for justice. All I'd like is to know what happened and bring her back home. She said that Annie was a really happy child growing up in America with dreams of becoming a school teacher, stating she was a good child and as a young adult she just seemed to be very happy with life. She loved being in school and she never, ever complained about it. She loved being over in Ireland and was always busy. She was either going to school or working. She loved cooking and she loved music. In Ireland, she was taking a beekeeping course and she was taking a dancing class and was hoping to qualify as a secondary school teacher. She went on to say that the Gardaí had told her if there was two people involved, someday one of them would talk to someone. But they said if there was only one person involved, we'll probably never know what happened. She went on to speak about Larry Murphy, who had several convictions for assault and one for the attempted murder of a woman in Ireland, saying, You can't rule out Larry Murphy or a serial killer, but I have a different feeling of what has happened to her. To gain any peace of mind at this point with regard to those thoughts would be a gift. Larry Murphy is one of many suspects in her disappearance. He fled Ireland in 2010 after serving 10 years of a 15-year sentence. He's also a suspect in the disappearance of other women who went missing in the 1990s in Ireland. But to date, nothing has been proven about his alleged involvement in any of these disappearances. In delving into the case on the disappearance of Annie McCarrick, I have been left with a mix of emotions and unanswered questions. The journey of researching and writing about her story has been both harrowing and eye-opening. Annie's disappearance stands as a stark reminder of the fragility of human life and the haunting reality of unsolved mysteries that continue to haunt us. As I conclude this podcast, I can't help but feel a deep sense of empathy for Annie's loved ones, especially her mother Nancy, who has been left without any closure. Her vanishing serves as a solemn call to remain vigilant and compassionate towards those who have experienced similar tragedies. Through shedding light on her case, I hope to contribute to a collective effort to bring justice to those whose voices have been silenced. May Annie's story never be forgotten and may we continue our efforts to uncover the truth, no matter how elusive it may seem. You've been listening to Island Crimes and Mysteries with Nils. Join us for another episode coming real soon.